Hey everybody, Jim Kerr here. Welcome to the Indispensable Conversation where I'm joined by my good friend, Todd Churches. Todd's the CEO of um, Big Blue Gumbo. He's a member of the MG100 and, and he's the author of this terrific book called Visual Leadership. Welcome aboard there, Todd. Hope you got your copy with you, man. I do, Jim. I couldn't decide which mug to bring, so I brought them both. I brought my Visual Leadership mug and I brought my Big Blue Gumball mug. So I'm going to be two fists to drinking. Although I don't drink coffee, so this is iced tea. So um, oh. I'm, re I'm all ready. I got, I got uh, both, both, uh, both sides loaded and ready to go. Yeah, what I find with these um, discussions, Todd, is you've got to stay hydrated, man. You've got to stay That's hydrated. <laughs> so glad you're you get, you get very heated, so you don't want to overheat yourself. <laughs> you got to drink plenty. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to jump right into the first question, man. All right. You ready? Should we always believe what we see? Should we always believe what we see? What, what do you think? Well, my first response is anytime I hear the word always, the light, the flash goes off, the the, the warning, warning light. So anytime I hear always and never any extremes, uh, as I say that to my students in my NYU and Columbia classes, um, you know, we throw around a lot of words like sometimes, usually, rarely, frequently, right? But always and never on those two ends of the continuum. It's very rare that anything's always or never. So I'll start with always. Um, but in terms of believing what we see, you know, there's all these sayings, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. I'll believe it when I see it. Seeing is believing. But in today's day and age, I don't think it is anymore. I think there's so many, you know, there's deep fakes. There's all kinds of this inattentional blindness. Which, you know, I don't know if you ever saw the the, um, the video of the People, the students throwing the basketball around and the gorilla guy in the gorilla suit walks by yeah. and no one sees him because they're so focused on counting the passes. So what we see, what we notice, what we look at, what, what we watch, we can't always believe our eyes in this day and age anymore. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's interesting that you bring that up. And yeah, I saw the, the gorilla um, video before and I thought that was really interesting. And, and I can remember seeing it for the very first time. I go, huh, I wonder if the gorilla is going to catch a pass. Like I... <laughs> Yeah. That, that was how I reacted to it in my in my own head. But I, I guess we don't really see with our eyes, right? We kind of see with our brains, don't we? You know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, the brain sends signals to the eyes. It tells us what to look at or what to look for, how to look, how long to look, yeah. you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a cognitive process, right? Like we're processing. Yeah, okay. yeah. We, you know, we talk about it as a metaphor as seeing, you know, the, the physical eye, but as you're 100% right, it is our brain. Just like when we say, you know, when you feel something in your heart, you're really feeling it in your brain, right? But so the heart is a metaphor in that case. So a lot of my work around visual thinking, visual leadership, visual communication deals with metaphor. And so a lot of times we use metaphors like that, like um, we can also see with our ears, right? Some, sometimes we talk about using visual language or poetry or song lyrics. I know you're a big song lyric guy. Um, you know, we take in information through our ears, but we process it visually in our brains, right? So if you see something in your mind's eye, a, t a term that was coined by Shakespeare in Hamlet when he saw the ghost of his father and didn't know if it was a figment of his imagination or a real apparition, we're talking about how do we get people to see what we're saying? That's such a big part of leadership, right? Is how do you get people to see what you're saying? How do you get an image or a vision or an idea out of your head? and into someone else's, that's a big part. And in the process of that, things can be distorted and filtered both through our lens and also through the lens of the person that we're speaking to. Yeah, you know, and you brought up the whole notion of the auditory. You know, I saw this um, interesting research out of St. Andrews University in Scotland. They did this this um, sort of experiment where they threw it, threw a story out and, and part of it was audio, part of it was visual. Some people only heard the story, some people only saw the story. And then they asked the subjects of the, of the experiment to recall what they saw, you know? And what was interesting was, and this gets at visual bias, which I really want to kind of go into with you here in a minute. And that, that was kind of that lead in question about we really see with our brains, but 
But what, what they found out was that the recall on the audio part was far more accurate than the recall on the visual part. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the conclusion that was drawn was we add our biases to the visual because we're seeing with our brains, you know, that kind of thing. And we're adding more to the story than was there or taking parts out that, w that were there and forgetting them and so on. So yeah. I, I don't know, like, what, what about that notion? You know, do we really go into the world with a fresh set of eyes or, or how does one do that, I guess? Yeah, I mean, our, we're, all, we're all inherently biased, right? We're biased. What we see, um, Thoreau, who's up, who's from up in your area, right? Uh, he said that it's not <laughs> what we look, it's not what we look at, but what we see that matters, right? So you can look at something. Two people can look at the exact same thing, but see com something completely different because we see them through the filters, through the lens of our experience. So our experiences are shaped by our upbringing, our education, our culture, our parents, all the institutions. So. Um, we need to realize that, and especially from a leadership perspective, I was reading this really good book, Visual uh, Indispensable, um, <laughs> and in the chapter on having the right vision, you talk about that. You talk about storytelling. You talk about how leaders see things and how we need to create a vision that's compelling and inspiring and that people can picture in their mind because, you know, people are not motivated by numbers. People are not motivated by, we're going to go from 20 million to 40 million next year. That's not a vision, right? The vision is what does it look like, feel like, be like. What will it be like when we get there, right? And I think you even say, write the vision statement in the tense as if it already happened, right? Because it manifests itself as if um, you see that reality. So what, what are your thoughts there in terms of vision? Because you can't separate vision from leadership because when I ask people, what's the first word you think of when you hear the word vision? Leadership is not number one, it's in the top three, but it's always mentioned because it's about having a picture of the future that is different from and better than the current reality, right? If you don't have a vision, then you just, you have no direction. Vision is the foundation of our strategy. So um, love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Well, you know, first of all, thanks for plugging my book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, wasn't expecting that. Um, yeah, right. I mean, uh, the, the key points in that chapter and vision is one of the six elements in the book that i'm saying are required to make a company indispensable but the thing with vision is you've got to be able to articulate it in such a way that people can see it taste it feel it understand it and want to be part of it that's right. like the, the real kicker is and i want to be part of this yes. and and it's got to be compelling and i recommend doing it in the form of a story and then bringing it out to the masses i.e socializing it in all different kinds of ways. Yeah. So it's audio, it's visual, it's presentations, it's, you know, um, I've even done stuff where we put a visual on a placemat, gave every employee the, the placemat to put on yeah. their desk, you know? So it's that kind of a, a, a thing that I think is required. But, you know, what, what, I, what I thought was really interesting in preparing for our conversation today, Todd, was that how strongly visual bias comes across. Right. Yeah. And, and it seems that, you know, a person's group membership leads us to view them in a certain light. So if they look a certain way or they have indications that they're part of this group versus that group, we're going to form an opinion and then we're going to basically behave the way we think we should, you know, yeah. in interacting with, with someone from there. And, then we, and we could be totally wrong. Right. Because we could, we could misunderstand the person completely just by what they're wearing or, or some sort of an indication. Yeah, so, there's cultural bias, there's gender bias, there's all those, it's, it's, and it's like, it's so ingrained in us that if we're not aware of it, we can't change it. So like one of the examples, I, I, uh, real life illustrations of this, I see when I do this exercise in my classes and workshops, um, I, I say, you have two minutes, I, draw, draw a picture of a leader, grab a pen and paper, just draw a picture of a leader. And 80% of the time people draw a picture of a middle-aged white male that looks like somewhat like Don Draper from Mad Men. Like that's the image of a leader. So under pressure, under time, you don't have time to think about it. That's the reaction. So what does that say in terms of bias? And you, know, you talk about diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity. If even for women, their picture in the in, in the moment of thinking about it, or actually without thinking about it, is draw a picture of a middle-aged white male, has an Im impact who we promote, who we hire, who we how we see people. So um, in order to change the reality, we need to change the picture in our mind. 
right? And it's sometimes it's so deeply embedded in the subconscious, like you're talking about visual bias, that we don't even realize it until someone raises that flag and, and brings it up. Yeah, you know, and it, and it happens sort of in a split second, too, yeah. you know, we're, we're just so, uh, you know, wired to, to make a quick, and I, I suppose it's yeah defense mechanisms, right? I'm, should I be fearing something right now? So I have to make a quick uh, impression and, and decide what to do. So, I, I, you know, it's it's really kind of deep in our sort of uh, our brain. Um, yeah. it's, sub it's, it's survival instincts 101. It's like who's in our tribe and who's not, right? right? right but the absolutely. thing is, if we're not aware of that, then we're going to be influenced by that subconsciously. And then we make decisions and take actions which could be biased or discriminatory. Right, you know, and back to the basic uh, first question, right? You know, can we believe what we see? Yeah. Um, let's play around with the branding aspect of this a bit. Um, and certainly visual bias plays deeply there. Um, you know, same message, different graphics. You know, if, I, if I'm selling watches and I've got a person of color in a hoodie wearing a watch that plays basketball, that's one thing. If I've got a professional golfer, you know, white middle-aged guy with gray hair with a, you know, with the same watch on, you know, who am I selling to? What am I influencing? Maybe talk a little bit about that. What, what's going on there for all our branding and marketing professionals out there? <laughs> yeah, again, we need to be more culturally diverse. What's interesting is not to do a, a free plug, but uh, if you notice, the cover of my book has a rainbow colored eye. Originally, I had a blue eye because my company is called Big Blue Gumball, so I wanted the brand consistency. But then it came to my attention and was reinforced by many others that the bla the blue eye was not inclusive, right? Mm. So I actually posted, uh, just as a promotional thing, I had already decided on going with the rainbow eye, but I posted on LinkedIn and Facebook, which book cover should I use? I had the blue eye and the rainbow colored eye. Not only did people favor the rainbow colored eye, like 90% to 10%, but people were actually accusing me of being like almost a racist for choosing the blue eye. No, I don't even have blue eyes. It was just a branding <laughs> thing. To me, it was just the color and I love the color blue. So it wasn't meant to be, to symbolize anything, you know, underhanded, but a lot of people saw it through that lens because it's such a sensitive topic right now that we really need to always be aware, just like you're saying, are we being inclusive of all different types of people? Um, and, and not alienating people, leaving people out. So the rainbow colored eye on my on my book cover represents the fact that no, just as no one in the world has that rainbow colored eye, no one in the world sees the world exactly through the same lens that you mm -hmm. do, right? Yeah. And, the, and the title of my book, Visual Leadership, one word with a shared capital L, represents the fact that who we are and how we lead is inseparable from the lens through which we see the world. So mm -hmm. we need to be, so, so throughout, even on the cover, before you even open the book, that concept is reinforced that we need to be aware of our biases. Um, otherwise, we're not going to be able to overcome them. And we're going to make bad business decisions as well. Yeah, you know, um, there's something to be said for for how, you know, we manipulate the selling of products, right? So back to kind of the branding question. And again, I'm, I'm quoting a, a, a set of ads that I've seen, you know, and clearly the, the marketing folks are aimed at, trying to attract different audiences because they're choosing different images to sell the same product, right? So, you know, in a sense, it can be used sort of against us. And I don't want to make it sound like there's this big, you know, conspiracy or anything, but people are leveraging visual bias as a way to sell stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. they definitely are. I started my career at Ogilvy and Mather Advertising way back in the 80s. And um, yeah, that was something you talk about is, you know, are we viewing things through the same old, like, you know, think about Mad Men and Don Draper um, and what advertising was back in the 50s, 60s and how things started to change in terms of, you know, you want more cultural diversity. You also want to be authentic. Like a lot of times things, I think you're kind of referring to this as, you know, are we manipulating people or are we really being sincere? Are we just, are we showing diversity just to sell something and hook people in, but then it's a bait and switch once we get there, right? So it's like, you know, some of the metaphors are like, are you invited? Are you invited to the party? Do you get a seat at the table once you get to the party? Shirley Chisholm, the black Af um, mm -hmm. black um, congresswoman from the 1960s in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, she said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair. <laughs> I love that metaphor because sometimes people do need to force their way in and open the doors for themselves. And then once they're at the table and they sell their value, they'll say, okay, we need to invite them back for next time. Sure. Or create your own table, 
right? If you're not invited right. to the table, we need you need to create your own table. So again, we're using metaphors here, but I think you're right in terms of you know our biases are just we're just wired that way, right? So we need to be aware of them so we can overcome them, and then you change the way you think and you change the world, right? But if you don't change the way you think, you're not nothing's going to change. Yeah, you know, and you you brought up even the notion of colors, right? You chose a, you chose a rainbow eye mm -hmm. versus a blue eye for a variety of reasons. Um, choice of colors is a huge part of visual bias too. You know, if I'm selling to a Latin and Hispanic audience, you know, I'm a marketeer and I'm trying to attract that group. If I use red, yellow, blue, that might be really attractive to Colombians, Venezuelans, Ecuadorians, right? Because those are the colors in their flag. Mm -hmm. But it may not do anything if, in attracting a Brazilian. Right, right. And yeah, if you, those, if you use red, white... colors don't mean anything to them. Yeah. You know? If you have a logo or you have something that's red, white, and blue, I mean, it's pretty obvious that, you know, it's it's you can't not think of the American flag, even if you try to, right? So there's, some, there's symbolism and color. Um, one of the exercises I do with my coaching clients is stop, start, continue using a traffic light as the symbol, as the metaphor, red, yellow, green, mm -hmm. whether you want to stop doing, continue doing, start doing. So colors are one of the primary ways, primary colors, uh, that we use visuals to communicate ideas. What's interesting, I don't know if you're familiar with De Bono's uh, six thinking hats model. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, the models I teach. There's um, red and white, black and yellow, green and blue. White hat thinking is, um, yellow hat thinking is positive and looking at the benefits of something, black hat thinking is using critical thinking, looking at risks and costs and negative things. One of my clients was just an African-American based company. They said that they didn't like the model and the black hat thinking specifically because they felt black hat was associated with negativity. And then there was, it was a very sensitive topic. And they asked if we could change that to a different color. Now, De Bono's model has been around since the 1960s. So right. could we have changed it to purple or a color we, we weren't that wasn't part of that model? We could have, but then we're changing his model, right? But just the fact that we're sensitive to the use of color and imagery, um, we need to be aware of that. Because sometimes we do things innocently. And I love the phrase, assume positive intent, give people a benefit of the doubt. Because a lot of times it's not meant to be discriminatory sometimes things that just aren't on your on your radar or you're not aware of the certain things but there are also cultural sensitivities that we need to be aware of and open to if we get that feedback so that's an interesting thing too is colors in china um when i was in china yellow was a color of royalty um as purple is in, in other cultures right so again know the culture that you're dealing with because there is no one size fits all with anything because like we're talking about there's bias and we're all seeing things through the lens of our cultures yeah, for sure. You know, and even things around physical beauty, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about who's in ads. Now we're changing that a little bit, yeah. right, lately, but not a lot. There's still really attractive people, uh, you know, of all shapes and sizes and yeah. colors and ethnicities and all that. But physical beauty seems to count big when it comes to how we respond to people, right? Yeah, and that, yeah, I mean, again, we are human, so a lot of things we're talking about, just the ways you started out talking about, the ways our, the way our brains are wired, right? We're drawn to certain things or drawn, or, you know, drawn away from certain things. And I think that's where, that with that awareness, we could be better leaders if we realize that how we see things or what we care about or what we like. Um, like if you're a CEO of a fashion company and your target market is millennials or Gen Z, you know, think how far removed you are from that. You know where I really see this is when I'm teaching, and I get I use song references, right? Um, I mentioned Elvis Costello's "Peace, Love, and Understanding" as a good leadership mantra. You know, if we try to create peace, lead with love, and go about things with understanding, um, we'll be more effective leaders. And yet, my millennial students, many of them from China, they have no idea who Elvis Costello is, right? So right. a lot of times, our 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 metaphors and our examples can connect us or alienate us from people. So we need to see things through the lens. Uh, that I call that flipping the eye. We need to flip the eye and look internally at our own biases, but we also see, try to, need to try to see the world through the lens of the people we're either selling to or partnering with or speaking to. Because again, it's so easy to just see the world through, from our lens as a you know baby boomer born in New York or this sure. year. And that's not the, the lens that everyone else in the world sees things through. Yeah, you know, Morris Massey way back when did a ton of research in that space and, and basically theorized that 
you know, we see things based on when we were born, mm -hmm. you know, the main events that were going on during our, our, you know, adolescence and early adulthood and so on. And that, you know, obviously frames the way we look at things. And there is a disconnect yeah. from generation to generation because we don't have shared experiences. We have some shared experiences, yeah. but they're not all the same, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, but, but, many, of my, many of my Seinfeld references, because I have the whole nine years memorized, not they, all, <laughs> they sometimes don't resonate. They sometimes, if I just say George Costanza, do the opposite. People are like, who's George Costanza, right? So right. Uh, yeah, yeah. we really need to be aware of our, our references and our metaphors. And sure. Here's a well, funny one you know, that I've heard before. I talk, I talked to my class about, I said, I repeated myself about asking a question. I said, I feel like a broken record here. My students thought a broken record was like breaking a world record in the Olympics and winning a gold medal. <laughs> I listened to a vinyl album and had no reference for like that needle getting stuck in the groove. And what's interesting yeah. is sometimes I'll listen to a song on Spotify and I'll expect the song to skip at that point where my album, yes. my yeah. album from 1978 skipped. So right. a lot of those references from our lives are not translatable into other generations or other cultures. So that was a real eye opener for me. Yeah, you know, and it's funny. I wonder if, if your copy of Darkness on the Edge of Town skips <laughs> in the same place mine does. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but back to the physical beauty thing, you know, again, some of the research is really astounding. You know, criminals who are perceived to be unattractive tend to have 300 plus greater fines, greater, you know, uh, uh, punishments than yeah. those that are, are better looking um just, just, there's, there's a classic example of that there was a new york um guy who got arrested he had a scar but he was like model good looking he ended up getting a modeling contract afterwards his headshot his uh his mug shot led to a headshot because this guy had these piercing blue eyes and he was just like this really good looking guy yeah. and uh that blew up so that's that's a real example of and, the flip that, side of that right and now he doesn't have to break into cars anymore exactly <laughs> yeah no i mean the study was interesting even even pay uh inside the company kind of to your earlier point about you know ceos and top leaders having biases and so on you know good looking men are making 17 percent more than not so good looking women 12 percent more and so on so so again you know we really can't believe what we see just because someone's good looking doesn't mean that they're competent in their job or deserve yeah. you know to make more money and, and so on you know where they found that also with moneyball and athletes who are perceived that they were built like an athlete and they look like they're on essential casting for a baseball player they were perceived as being more skilled than the people who maybe were a little overweight or whatever but if you looked at the numbers that the numbers were more accurate than, but a lot of scouts were looking at people. Oh, he's a good looking guy. He's, he's, he's built like he'll be the yeah. poster child, poster boy for this team. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he was the best athlete. And same thing with, you know, shows like The Voice, right? They let you listen to the singing with your back to the singer because we're biased by how people look in terms of American Idol or any of those things. So um, height, height is a big thing, right? Um, what's interesting, I'm 6'4", and a lot of people don't know that because they only know me from Zoom. And on Zoom, we're all the same height. But you meet someone, we have perceptions of people think, oh, I thought you were taller or shorter based on how, how are you judging based on, you know, this little box that we're looking at right now. Right. But I think you're right. It's like attractiveness, height, all of these physical factors that may be totally unrelated to what we're doing, like hiring someone, but they do um, influence um, our, our decisions. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, again, kind of staying on that branding marketing thing, I saw an interesting study from Google that basically talked about how quickly somebody decides to do business with a company online. And they said that literally in less than 17 milliseconds, someone makes a judgment call based on what the website looks like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, so you, yeah, you kind of... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> hiring, hiring, you may not decide to hire someone within a few seconds, but you may decide not to, right? You know, 30 seconds, you know, we talk about an elevator pitch being 30 seconds. People make decisions in, like you're saying, milliseconds. So you don't always have that 30 seconds to get your point across or to get your message out there. Yeah, and you know, and and what it does is it, it it tells me, that study anyway, tells me that you've got to spend more time on the sizzle maybe than uh, than the steak you know um because 
you know, if you're, if someone perceives your website to be less than top notch, you know, because of the way it looks and they're perceiving you to be less than top notch in whatever it is you're selling. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, appearances count, I suppose. Um, yeah. I mean, my three E's are educate, engage, and excite. So educate is what you want people to learn and know. Engage is how you're going to capture and hold their attention. Excite is how you're going to motivate them to take some action. But it really does start with the engage. If, you, if someone's not engaged, you're not even going to get a chance to educate them. So even though I say educate, engage, and excite as my, as our, company model or philosophy or approach, it really does start with engage in some ways excite, right? It's almost goes backwards. Like if you can get someone excited, then you could get them engaged and then you could educate them. So it's kind of like, it's interesting. You need all three of those, but right. like you're saying, if you don't, you're not even going to get a chance to get your message heard. If people can't get past the initial first impression or the, what your website looks like and other factors. So that's definitely, yeah. um, it may not be fair, but it's just, again, how, how we're wired as humans. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, I know our time's winding down a bit, but I'd love to hear your um, impressions on this question. You know, it seems to me that despite our best intentions, and I'm shifting gears, I'm warning you, right? All right. It's almost impossible to pre present information, and think about all the ways we've talked about it already today, uh, in a completely neutral way. And we can bias even decisions, right, in the way we present information and presentations and pitches and so on. What do we do? What do we do? About that? I know you talk a lot about it in visual leadership and that, and again, it's a great book. I, I, I wish we could just spend time talking about it, but what's your best advice there, Todd? Yeah. You know, when you talk about neutrality, neutrality does not exist. Everything there's bias built. You know where I really realized this when I was in, um, in college getting my master's at from SUNY Albany, uh, in master's in communication, I did an internship at NBC News in the summer of 1984. I worked in the Today Show and, and NBC Nightly News. You, you watch a 30-minute news show and you think, all right, that's what happened today. You don't even think about the bias in what stories are chosen and where they're yeah. placed and in what yeah. sequence, right? So it's like you think, oh, news is objective, right? Now we know differently because there's so much bias and debate about the media and fake news and all that kind of stuff. But back then, you naively go in to say, oh, news is neutral. It's a reporting of the facts. This is what happened today. But someone had to pick what gets in 30 minutes. It's really only 23 minutes when you take out commercial time, right? So what are the stories that get that 23 minutes? There's no neutrality. There's bias in terms of which stories are chosen and which stories get attention and, and in what priority order. So I think if we realize that there is no neutrality, um, within ourselves, that's a first step in changing that and improving things and making things better, not only for yourself, but for others. But I think neutrality is a myth. Um, it just doesn't exist. Well, sort of one last question, you know, and it, and it goes all the way back to our first one about whether we should believe what we see. You know, are there, is there any advice you can give people to help them not fall into those visual biases that they may have? You know, like what's, with some good advice. And I know there's some in your book, so maybe you, get, you can borrow some from there. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, to me, the first thing, my first reaction is just be a critical thinker. Um, in fact, there was a cartoon that just popped up on Facebook today. I posted it years ago, but you know how they give you flashbacks of things you posted? There's two lines, um, a line of people lining up at simple, but simple, but uneasy. And there, that's the long line and complex. <laughs> and, oh, it was simple, but untrue versus complex and true. And the, there were like two people on that line and everyone else lined up at the other line like sure. lemmings and they're falling off the cliff. Because right. it's just so much easier to believe something that's simple and that supports our biases, right? If we believe something, we're gonna say, oh, that's proof of what I believe. If it goes against what we believe, we often either miss it or we discount it. So I think to me, the main thing is be a critical thinker, question everything, question the source. If you're aware of your biases and assumptions, then you will be a more, better critical thinker and make better decisions as opposed to just getting information that it's confirmation bias, right? It's just things right. that confirm what you already believe. So that's right. why if we get things from other sources and look at things with a fresh lens, um, I'll just end with the quote from Marcel Proust saying that the real voyage of discovery consists not with seeing new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And right. if we could see things with new eyes, we would notice things that we hadn't before and see the world in a, in, a, in a different way. And that opens up the world of possibilities. Yeah, you know, for sure, Todd. And I, and I agree with you. I think it actually did a segment on critical thinking earlier in the year yeah. um, with um, with a, a, a thought leader. And, and the, the 
bottom line was it was like yeah we've almost lost the art of critical thinking you know because we do choose the easy button you know yeah. over and over again um hey look this was a great conversation i really right. appreciate you coming on um I, you know i'm not sure if we answered any questions but hopefully we highlighted the important stuff when it comes to <laughs> well, one, of, one, of what we're is, one of my sayings is that wisdom comes not from answering questions but from questioning answers so if people are questioning answers when they leave here then they got something out of it today yeah, for sure. And you know what? We can carry on the conversation on LinkedIn Live. I invite everyone to do that. Um, before we say goodbye, though, I do want to mention the next episode. And you're going to like this one, Todd, because I think you know her. I'm, I'm going to have a special episode on Thursday, not Friday, Thursday, December 2nd at 4 p.m., not 10 a.m. And that's to accommodate my guest, Verity Craft, who's going to be beaming in all the way from New Zealand. Wow, very cool. And and here's the here's the question we're going to explore together. Okay, let, let me know what you think of this. All right. Is ageism truly a growing trend in business today? All right. I look forward to that. Kind of, are these <laughs> are these amazing? And just, it's worth tuning in just for her accent from New Zealand. So uh, I, I I think so too. Yes. Hey, hey Todd, thanks a lot, man. And thanks for having me. Thank you.